Chapter seven, part two of Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Part two, chapter seven. In so far as the architect desired the happiness of his kind patronesses, it was a pleasure to him now that at last he was obliged to go to know that he was leaving them in good society with the estimable assistant at the same time however when he thought of their goodness in its relation to himself he could not help feeling it a little painful to see his place so soon and as it seemed to his modesty so well so completely supplied he had lingered and lingered but now he forced himself away what after he was gone he must endure as he could at least he could not stay to witness with his own eyes to the greater relief of this half melancholy feeling the ladies at his departure made him a present of a waistcoat, upon which he had watched them both for some time past at work, with a silent envy of the fortunate unknown to whom it was by and by to belong. Such a present is the most agreeable which a true-hearted man can receive, for while he thinks of the unwearied play of the beautiful fingers at the making of it, he cannot help flattering himself that, in so long sustained a labour, the feeling could not have remained utterly without an interest in its accomplishment. The ladies had now a new visitor to entertain, for whom they felt a real regard, and who stay with them it would be their endeavour to make it as agreeable as they could. There is in all women a peculiar circle of inward interests which remain always the same, and from which nothing in the world can divorce them. In outward social intercourse, on the other hand, they will gladly and easily allow themselves to take their tone from the person with whom at the moment they are occupied, and thus by a mixture of impassiveness and susceptibility, by persisting and by yielding, they continue to keep the government to themselves, and no man in the cultivated world can ever take it from them the architect following at the same time his own fancy and his own inclination had been exerting himself in putting out his talents for their gratification and for the purposes of his friends and business and amusement while he was with them had been conducted in this spirit and directed to the ends which most suited his taste but now in a short time through the presence of the assistant quite another sort of life was commenced his great gift was to talk well, and to treat in his conversation of men and human relations, particularly in reference to the cultivation of young people. Thus arose a very perceptible contrast to the life which had been going on hitherto, all the more as the assistant could not entirely approve of their having interested themselves in such subjects so exclusively. Of the impersonated picture which received him on arrival, he never said a single word. On the other hand, when they took him to see the church and the chapel with their new decorations, expecting to please him as much as they were pleased themselves he did not hesitate to express a very contrary opinion about it this mixing up of the holy with the sensuous he said is anything but pleasing to my taste i cannot like men to set apart certain especial places consecrate them and deck them out that by so doing they may nourish in themselves a temper of piety no ornaments not even the very simplest should disturb in us that sense of the divine being which accompanies us wherever we are and can consecrate every spot into a temple what pleases me is to see a home service of god held in the saloon where people come together to eat where they have their parties and amuse themselves with games and dances the highest the most excellent in men has no form and one should be cautious how one gives it any form except noble action charlotte who was already generally acquainted with his mode of thinking and in the short time he had been at the castle had already probed it more deeply found something also which he might do for her in his own department and she had her garden children whom the architect had reviewed shortly before his departure marshalled up into the great saloon in their bright clean uniforms with their regular orderly movement and their own natural vivacity they looked exceedingly well the assistant examined them in his own way and by a variety of questions and by the turns which he gave them soon brought to light the capacities and dispositions of the children and without its seeming so in the space of less than one hour he had really given them important instruction and assistance how did you manage that said charlotte as the children marched away i listened with all my attention nothing was brought forward except things which were quite familiar and yet i cannot tell the least how i should begin to bring them to be discussed in so short a time so methodically with all this questioning and answering perhaps replied the assistant we ought to make a secret of the tricks of our own handicraft however i will not hide from you one very simple maxim with the help of which you may do this and a great deal more than this take any subject a substance an idea whatever you like keep fast hold of it make yourself thoroughly acquainted with it in all its parts 
and then it will be easy for you in conversation to find out with a mass of children how much about it has already developed itself in them what requires to be stimulated what to be directly communicated the answers to your questions may be as unsatisfactory as they will they may wander wide of the mark if you only take care that your counter question shall draw their thoughts and senses inwards again if you do not allow yourself to be driven from your own position the children will at last reflect comprehend learn only what the teacher desires them to learn and the subject will be presented to them in the light in which he wishes them to see it the greatest mistake which he can make is to allow himself to be run away with from the subject not to know how to keep fast to the point with which he is engaged do you try this on your own account the next time the children come you will find you will be greatly entertained by it yourself that is very good said charlotte the right method of teaching is the reverse i see of what we must do in life in society we must keep the attention long upon nothing and in instruction the first commandment is to permit no dissipation of it variety without dissipation were the best motto for both teaching and life if this desirable equipoise were easy to be preserved said the assistant and he was going on further with the subject when charlotte called out to him to look again at the children whose merry troop were at the moment moving across the court he expressed his satisfaction at seeing them wearing a uniform men he said should wear a uniform from their childhood upwards they have to accustom themselves to work together to lose themselves among their equals to obey in masses and to work on a large scale every kind of uniform moreover generates a military habit of thought and a smart straightforward carriage all boys are born soldiers whatever you do with them you have only to watch them at their mock fights and games their storming parties and scaling parties on the other hand you will not blame me replied ottilie if i do not insist with my girls on such unity of costume when i introduce them to you i hope to gratify you by a party-coloured mixture i approve of that entirely replied the other women should go about in every sort of variety of dress each following her own style and her own likings that each may learn to feel what sits well upon her and becomes her and for a more weighty reason as well because it is appointed for them to stand alone all their lives and work alone that seems to me to be a paradox answered charlotte are we then to be never anything for ourselves oh yes replied the assistant in respect of other women assuredly but observe a young lady as a lover as a bride as a housewife as a mother she always stands isolated she is always alone and will be alone even the most empty-headed woman is in the same case each one of them excludes all others it is her nature to do so because of each one of them is required everything which the entire sex have to do with a man it is altogether different he would make a second man if there were none but a woman might live to an eternity without even so much as thinking of producing a duplicate of herself one has only to say the truth in a strange way said charlotte and at last the strangest thing will seem to be true we will accept what is good for us out of your observations and yet as women we will hold together with women and do common work with them too not to give the other sex too great an advantage over us indeed you must not take it ill of us if in future we come to feel a little malicious satisfaction when our lords and masters do not get on in the very best way together with much care this wise sensible person went on to examine more closely how ottilie proceeded with her little pupils and expressed his marked approbation of it you are entirely right he said in directing these children only to what they can immediately and usefully put in practice cleanliness for instance will accustom them to wear their clothes with pleasure to themselves and everything is gained if they can be induced to enter into what they do with cheerfulness and self-reflection in other ways he found to his great satisfaction that nothing had been done for outward display but all was inward and designed to supply what was indispensably necessary in how few words he cried might the whole business of education be summed up if people had but ears to hear will you try whether i have any ears said ottilie smiling indeed i will answered he only you must not betray me educate the boys to be servants and the girls to be mothers and everything is as it should be to be mothers replied ottilie women would scarcely think that sufficient they have to look forward without being mothers to going out into service and indeed our young men think themselves a great deal too good for servants one can see easily in every one of them that he holds himself far fitter to be a master and for that reason we should say nothing about it to them said the assistant we flatter ourselves on into life but life flatters not us how many men would like to acknowledge at the outset what at the end they must acknowledge whether they like it or not but let us leave these considerations which do not concern us here i consider you very fortunate in having been able to go so methodically to work with your pupils if your very little ones run about with their dolls and stitch together a few petticoats for them 
if the elder sisters will then take care of the younger and the whole household know how to supply its own wants and one member of it help the others the further step into life will not then be great and such a girl will find in her husband what she has lost in her parents but among the higher ranks the problem is a sorely intricate one we have to provide for higher finer more delicate relations especially for such as arise out of society we are therefore obliged to give our pupils an outward cultivation it is indispensable it is necessary and it may be really valuable if we do not overstep the proper measure in it only it is so easy while one is proposing to cultivate the children for a wider circle to drive them out into the indefinite without keeping before our eyes the real requisites of the inner nature here lies a problem which more or less must be either solved or blundered over by all educators many things with which we furnish our scholars at the school do not please me because experience tells me of how little service they are likely to be in after life how much is not at once stripped off how much is not at once committed to oblivion as soon as the young lady finds herself in the position of a housewife or a mother in the meantime since i have devoted myself to this occupation i cannot but entertain a devout hope that one day with the companionship of some faithful helpmate i may succeed in cultivating purely in my pupils that and that only which they will require when they pass out into the field of independent activity and self-reliance that i may be able to say to myself in this sense is their education completed another education there is indeed which will again speedily recommence and work on well nigh through all the years of our life the education which circumstances will give us if we do not give it to ourselves how true ottilie felt were these words what had not a passion little dreamed of before done to educate her in the past year what trials did she not see hovering before her if she looked forward only to the next to the very next which was now so near it was not without a purpose that the young man had spoken of a helpmate of a wife for with all his diffidence he could not refrain from thus remotely hinting at his own wishes a number of circumstances and accidents indeed combined to induce him on this visit to approach a few steps towards his aim the lady superior of the school was advanced in years she had been already for some time looking about among her fellow labourers male and female for some person whom she could take into partnership with herself and at last had made proposals to the assistant in whom she had the highest ground for feeling confidence he was to conduct the business of the school with herself he was to work with her in it as if it was his own and after her death as her heir to enter upon it as sole proprietor the principal thing now seemed to be that he should find a wife who would cooperate with him ottilie was secretly before his eyes and before his heart a number of difficulties suggested themselves and yet again there were favourable circumstances on the other side to counterbalance them luciana had left the school ottilie could therefore return with less difficulty of the affair with edward some little had transpired it passed however as many such things do as a matter of indifference and this very circumstance might make it desirable that she should leave the castle and yet perhaps no decision would have been arrived at no step would have been taken had not an unexpected visit given a special impulse to his hesitation the appearance of remarkable people in any and every circle can never be without its effects the count and the baroness who often found themselves asked for their opinion almost every one being in difficulty about the education of their children as to the value of the various schools had found it desirable to make themselves particularly acquainted with this one which was generally so well spoken of and under their present circumstances they were more easily able to carry on these inquiries in company the baroness however had something else in view as well while she was last at the castle she had talked over with charlotte the whole affair of edward and ottilie she had insisted again and again that ottilie must be sent away she tried every means to encourage charlotte to do it and to keep her from being frightened by edward's threats several modes of escape from the difficulty were suggested accidentally the school was mentioned and the assistant and his incipient passion which made the baroness more resolved than ever to pay her intended visit there she went she made acquaintance with the assistant looked over the establishment and spoke of ottilie the count also spoke with much interest of her having in his recent visit learnt to know her better she had been drawn towards him indeed she had felt attracted by him believing that she could see that she could perceive in his solid substantial conversation something to which hitherto she had been an entire stranger in her intercourse with edward the world had been utterly forgotten in the presence of the count the world appeared first worth regarding the attraction was mutual the count conceived a liking for ottilie he would have been glad to have had her for a daughter thus a second time and worse than the first time she was in the way of the baroness who knows what in times when passions ran hotter than they do nowadays this lady might not have devised against her 
as things were it was enough if she could get her married and render her more innocuous for the future to the peace of mind of married women she therefore artfully urged the assistant in a delicate but effective manner to set out on a little excursion to the castle where his plans and his wishes of which he made no secret to the lady he might forthwith take steps to realize with the fullest consent of the superior he started off on his expedition and in his heart he nourished good hopes of success he knew that ottilie was not ill disposed towards him and although it was true there was some disproportion of rank between them yet distinctions of this kind were fast disappearing in the temper of the time moreover the baroness had made him perceive clearly that ottilie must always remain a poor portionless maiden to be related to a wealthy family it was said could be of service to nobody for even with the largest property men have a feeling that it is not right to deprive of any considerable sum those who as standing in a nearer degree of relationship appear to have a fuller right to possession and really it is a strange thing that the immense privilege which a man has of disposing of his property after his death he so very seldom uses for the benefit of those whom he loves out of regard to established usage only appearing to consider those who would inherit his estate from him supposing he made no will at all thus while on his journey he grew to feel himself entirely on a level with ottilie a favourable reception raised his hopes he found ottilie indeed not altogether so open with him as usual but she was considerably matured more developed and if you please generally more conversable than he had known her she was ready to give him the fullest insight into many things which were in any way connected with his profession but when he attempted to approach his proper object a certain inward shyness always held him back once however charlotte gave him an opportunity for saying something in ottilie's presence she said to him well now you have looked closely enough into everything which is going forward in my circle how do you find ottilie you had better say while she is here hereupon the assistant signified with a clear perception and composed expression how that in respect of a freer carriage of an easier manner in speaking of a higher insight into the things of the world which showed itself more in actions than in words he found ottilie altered much for the better but that he still believed it might be of serious advantage to her if she would go back for some little time to the school in order methodically and thoroughly to make her own for ever what the world was only imparting to her in fragments and pieces rather perplexing her than satisfying her and often too late to be of service he did not wish to be prolix about it ottilie herself knew best how much method and connection there was in the style of instruction out of which in that case she would be taken ottilie had nothing to say against this she could not acknowledge what it was which these words made her feel because she was hardly able to explain it to herself it seemed to her as if nothing in the world was disconnected so long as she thought of the one person whom she loved and she could not conceive how without him anything could be connected at all charlotte replied to the proposal with a wise kindness she said that herself as well as ottilie had long desired her return to the school at that time however the presence of so dear a companion and helper had become indispensable to herself still she would offer no obstacle at some future period if ottilie continued to wish it to her going back there for such a time as would enable her to complete what she had begun and to make entirely her own what had been interrupted the assistant listened with delight to this qualified assent ottilie did not venture to say anything against it although the very thought made her shudder charlotte on her side thought only how to gain time she hoped that edward would soon come back and find himself a happy father then she was convinced all would go right and one way or another they would be able to settle something for ottilie after an important conversation which has furnished matter for after reflection to all who have taken part in it there commonly follows a sort of pause which in appearance is like a general embarrassment they walked up and down the saloon the assistant turned over the leaves of various books and came at last on the folio of engravings which had remained lying there since luciana's time as soon as he saw that it contained nothing but apes he shut it up again it may have been this however which gave occasion to a conversation of which we find traces in ottilie's diary from ottilie's diary it is strange how men can have the heart to take such pains with the pictures of those hideous monkeys one lowers oneself sufficiently when one looks at them merely as animals but it is really wicked to give way to the inclination to look for people whom we know behind such masks it is a sure mark of a certain obliquity to take pleasure in caricatures and monstrous faces and pygmies i have to thank our kind assistant that i have never been vexed with natural history i could never make myself at home with worms and beetles just now he acknowledged to me that it was the same with him of nature he said we ought to know nothing except what is actually alive immediately around us with the trees which blossom and put out leaves and bear fruit in our own neighbourhood with every shrub which we pass by with every blade of grass on which we tread we stand in a real relation they are our genuine compatriots 
the birds which hop up and down among our branches which sing among our leaves belong to us they speak to us from our childhood upwards and we learn to understand their language but let a man ask himself whether or not every strange creature torn out of its natural environment does not at first sight make a sort of painful impression upon him which is only deadened by custom it is a mark of a motley dissipated sort of life to be able to endure monkeys and parrots and black people about oneself many times when a certain longing curiosity about these strange objects has come over me i have envied the traveller who sees such marvels in living everyday connection with other marvels but he too must have become another man palm trees will not allow a man to wander among them with impunity and doubtless his tone of thinking becomes very different in a land where elephants and tigers are at home the only inquirers into nature whom we care to respect are such as know how to describe and to represent to us the strange wonderful things which they have seen in their proper locality each in its own especial element how i should enjoy once hearing humboldt talk a cabinet of natural curiosities we may regard like an egyptian burying place where the various plant gods and animal gods stand about embalmed it may be well enough for a priest caste to busy itself with such things in a twilight of mystery but in general instruction they have no place or business and we must beware of them all the more because what is nearer to us and more valuable may be so easily thrust aside by them a teacher who can arouse a feeling for one single good action for one single good poem accomplishes more than he who fills our memory with rows on rows of natural objects classified with name and form for what is the result of all these except what we know as well without them that the human figure pre-eminently and peculiarly is made in the image and likeness of god individuals may be left to occupy themselves with whatever amuses them with whatever gives them pleasure whatever they think useful but the proper study of mankind is man End of chapter seven part two chapter eight of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter eight there are but few men who care to occupy themselves with the immediate past either we are forcibly bound up in the present or we lose ourselves in the long gone by and seek back for what is utterly lost as if it were possible to summon it up again and rehabilitate it even in great and wealthy families who are under large obligations to their ancestors we commonly find men thinking more of their grandfathers than their fathers such reflections as these suggested themselves to our assistant as on one of those beautiful days in which the departing winter is accustomed to intimate the spring he had been walking up and down the great old castle garden and admiring the tall avenues of the lindens and the formal walks and flower-beds which had been laid out by edward's father the trees had thriven admirably according to the design of him who had planted them and now when they ought to have begun to be valued and enjoyed no one ever spoke to them hardly any one even went near them and the interest and the outlay was now directed to the other side out into the free and the open he remarked upon it to charlotte on his return she did not take it unkindly while life is sweeping us forward she replied we fancy that we are acting out our own impulses we believe that we choose ourselves what we will do and what we will enjoy but in fact if we look at it closely our actions are no more than the plans and the desires of the time which we are compelled to carry out no doubt said the assistant and who is strong enough to withstand the stream of what is round him time passes on and in it opinions thoughts prejudices and interests if the youth of the sun falls in the era of revolution we may feel assured that he will have nothing in common with his father if the father lived at a time when the desire was to accumulate property to secure the possession of it to narrow and to gather oneself in and to base one's enjoyment in separation from the world the son will at once seek to extend himself to communicate himself to others to spread himself over a wide surface and open out his closed stores entire periods replied charlotte resemble the father and son whom you have been describing of the state of things when every little town was obliged to have its walls and moats when the castle of the nobleman was built in a swamp and the smallest manor-houses were only accessible by a drawbridge we are scarcely able to form a conception in our days the larger cities take down their walls the moats of the prince's castles are filled in cities are no more than great places and when one travels and sees all this one might fancy that universal peace was just established and the golden age was before the door 
no one feels himself easy in a garden which does not look like the open country there must be nothing to remind him of form and constraint we choose to be entirely free and to draw our breath without sense of confinement do you conceive it possible my friend that we can ever return again out of this into another into our former condition why should we not replied the assistant every condition has its own burden along with it the most relaxed as well as the most constrained the first presupposes abundance and leads to extravagance let want reappear and the spirit of moderation is at once with us again men who are obliged to make use of their space and their soil will speedily enough raise walls up round their gardens to be sure of their crops and plants out of this will arise by degrees a new phase of things the useful will again gain the upper hand and even the man of large possessions will feel at last that he must make the most of all which belongs to him believe me it is quite possible that your son may become indifferent to all which you have been doing in the park and draw in again behind the solemn walls and the tall lindens of his grandfather the secret pleasure which it gave charlotte to have a son foretold to her made her forgive the assistant his somewhat unfriendly prophecy of how it might one day fare with her lovely beautiful park she therefore answered without any discomposure you and i are not old enough yet to have lived through very much of these contradictions and yet when i look back into my own early youth when i remember the style of complaints which i used then to hear from older people and when i think at the same time of what the country and the town then were i have nothing to advance against what you say but is there nothing which one can do to remedy this natural course of things are father and son parents and children to be always thus unable to understand each other you have been so kind as to prophesy a boy to me is it necessary that he must stand in contradiction to his father must he destroy what his parents have erected instead of completing it instead of following on upon the same idea and elevating it there is a rational remedy for it replied the assistant but it is one which will be but seldom put in practice by men the father should raise his son to a joint ownership with himself he should permit him to plant and to build and allow him the same innocent liberty which he allows to himself one form of activity may be woven into another but it cannot be pieced on to it a young shoot may be readily and easily grafted with an old stem to which no grown branch admits of being fastened the assistant was glad to have the opportunity at the moment when he saw himself obliged to take his leave of saying something agreeable to charlotte and thus making himself a new link to secure her favour he had been already too long absent from home and yet he could not make up his mind to return there until after a full conviction that he must allow the approaching epoch of charlotte's confinement first to pass by before he could look for any decision from her in respect to ottilie he therefore accommodated himself to the circumstances and returned with these prospects and hopes to the superior charlotte's confinement was now approaching she kept more in her own room the ladies who had gathered about her were her closest companions ottilie managed all domestic matters hardly able however the while to think what she was doing she had indeed utterly resigned herself she desired to continue to exert herself to the extent of her power for charlotte for the child for edward but she could not see how it would be possible for her nothing could save her from utter distraction except patiently to do the duty which each day brought with it her son was brought happily into the world and the ladies declared with one voice it was the very image of its father only ottilie as she wished the new mother joy and kissed the child with all her heart was unable to see the likeness once already charlotte had felt most painfully the absence of her husband when she had to make preparations for her daughter's marriage and now the father could not be present at the birth of his son he could not have the choosing of the name by which the child was hereafter to be called the first among all charlotte's friends who came to wish her joy was mittler he had placed expresses ready to bring him news the instant the event took place he was admitted to see her and scarcely able to conceal his triumph even before ottilie when alone with charlotte he broke fairly out with it and was at once ready with means to remove all anxieties and set aside all immediate difficulties the baptism should not be delayed a day longer than necessary the old clergyman who had one foot already in the grave should leave his blessing to bind together the past and the future the child should be called otto what name would he bear so fitly as that of his father and of his father's friend it required the peremptory resolution of this man to set aside the innumerable considerations arguments hesitations difficulties what this person knew and that person knew better the opinions up and down and backwards and forwards which every friend volunteered it always happens on such occasions that when one inconvenience is removed a fresh inconvenience seems to arise and in wishing to spare all sides we inevitably go wrong on one side or the other the letters to friends and relations were all undertaken by mittler and they were to be written and sent off at once 
it was highly necessary he thought that the good fortune which he considered so important for the family should be known as widely as possible through the ill-natured and misinterpreting world for indeed these late entanglements and perplexities had got abroad among the public which at all times has a conviction that whatever happens happens only in order that it may have something to talk about the ceremony of the baptism was to be observed with all due honour but it was to be as brief and as private as possible the people came together ottilie and mittler were to hold the child as sponsors the old pastor supported by the servants of the church came in with slow steps the prayers were offered the child lay in ottilie's arms and as she was looking affectionately down at it it opened its eyes and she was not a little startled when she seemed to see her own eyes looking at her the likeness would have surprised any one mittler who next had to receive the child started as well he fancying he saw in the little features a most striking likeness to the captain he had never seen a resemblance so marked the infirmity of the good old clergyman had not permitted him to accompany the ceremony with more than the usual liturgy mittler however who was full of his subject recollected his old performances when he had been in the ministry and indeed it was one of his peculiarities that on every sort of occasion he always thought what he would like to say and how he would express himself about it at this time he was the less able to contain himself as he was now in the midst of a circle consisting entirely of well-known friends he began therefore towards the conclusion of the service to put himself quietly into the place of the clergyman to make cheerful speeches aloud expressive of his duty and his hopes as godfather and to dwell all the longer on the subject as he thought he saw in charlotte's gratified manner that she was pleased with his doing so it altogether escaped the eagerness of the orator that the good old man would gladly have set down still less did he think that he was on the way to occasion a more serious evil after he had described with all his power of impressiveness the relation in which every person present stood toward the child thereby putting ottilie's composure sorely to the proof he turned at last to the old man with the words and you my worthy father you may now well say with simeon lord now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace for mine eyes have seen the saviour of this house he was now in full swing towards a brilliant peroration when he perceived the old man to whom he held out the child first appear a little to incline towards it and immediately after to totter and sink backwards hardly prevented from falling he was lifted to a seat but notwithstanding the instant assistance which was rendered he was found to be dead to see thus side by side birth and death the coffin and the cradle to see them and to realize them to comprehend not with the eye of imagination but with the bodily eye at one moment these fearful opposites was a hard trial to the spectators the harder the more utterly it had taken them by surprise ottilie alone stood contemplating the slumberer whose features still retained their gentle sweet expression with a kind of envy the life of her soul was killed why should the bodily life any longer drag on in weariness but though ottilie was frequently led by melancholy incidents which occurred in the day to thoughts of the past of separation and of loss at night she had strange visions given her to comfort her which assured her of the existence of her beloved and thus strengthened her and gave her life for her own when she laid herself down at night to rest and was floating among sweet sensations between sleep and waking she seemed to be looking into a clear but softly illuminated space in this she would see edward with the greatest distinctness and not in the dress in which she had been accustomed to see him but in military uniform never in the same position but always in a natural one and not the least with anything fantastic about him either standing or walking or lying down or riding the figure which was painted with the utmost minuteness moved readily before her without any effort of hers without her willing it or exerting her imagination to produce it frequently she saw him surrounded with something in motion which was darker than the bright ground but the figures were shadowy and she could scarcely distinguish them sometimes they were like men sometimes they were like horses or like trees or like mountains she usually went to sleep in the midst of the apparition and when after a quiet night she woke again in the morning she felt refreshed and comforted she could say to herself edward still lives and she herself was still remaining in the closest relation towards him End of chapter eight chapter nine of elective affinities part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter nine the spring was come it was late but it therefore burst out more rapidly 
and more exhilaratingly than usual ottilie now found in the garden the fruits of her carefulness everything shot up and came out in leaf and flower at its proper time a number of plants which she had been training up under glass frames and in hotbeds now burst forward at once to meet at last the advances of nature and whatever there was to do and to take care of it did not remain the mere labour of hope which it had been but brought its reward in immediate and substantial enjoyment there is many a chasm however among the finer shoots produced by luciana's wild ways for which she had to console the gardener and the symmetry of many a leafy coronet was destroyed she tried to encourage him to hope that it would all be soon restored again but he had too deep a feeling and too pure an idea of the nature of his business for such grounds of comfort to be of much service with him little as the gardener allowed himself to have his attention dissipated by other tastes and inclinations he could the less bear to have the peaceful course interrupted which the plant follows towards its enduring or its transient perfection a plant is like a self-willed man out of whom we can obtain all which we desire if we will only treat him his own way a calm eye a silent method in all seasons of the year and at every hour to do exactly what has then to be done is required of no one perhaps more than of a gardener these qualities the good man possessed in an eminent degree and it was on that account that ottilie liked so well to work with him but for some time past he had not found himself able to exercise his peculiar talent with any pleasure to himself whatever concerned the fruit gardening or kitchen gardening as well as whatever had in time past been required in the ornamental gardens he understood perfectly one man succeeds in one thing another in another he succeeded in these in his management of the orangery of the bulbous flowers in budding shoots and growing cuttings from the carnations and auriculas he might challenge nature herself but the new ornamental shrubs and fashionable flowers remained in a measure strange to him he had a kind of shyness of the endless field of botany which had been lately opening itself and the strange names humming about his ears made him cross and ill-tempered the orders for flowers which had been made by his lord and lady in the course of the past year he considered so much useless waste and extravagance all the more as he saw many valuable plants disappear and as he had ceased to stand on the best possible terms with the nursery gardeners who he fancied had not been serving him honestly consequently after a number of attempts he had formed a sort of a plan in which ottilie encouraged him the more readily because its first essential condition was the return of edward whose absence in this as in many other matters every day had to be felt more and more seriously now that the plants were ever striking new roots and putting out their shoots ottilie felt herself even more fettered to this spot it was just a year since she had come there as a stranger as a mere insignificant creature how much had she not gained for herself since that time but alas how much had she not also since that time lost again never had she been so rich and never so poor the feelings of her loss and of her gain alternated momentarily one with another chasing each other through her heart and she could find no other means to help herself except always to set to work again at what lay nearest to her with such interest and eagerness as she could command that everything which she knew to be dear to edward received a special care from her may be supposed and why should she not hope that he himself would now soon come back again and that when present he would show himself grateful for all the care and pains which she had taken for him in his absence but there was also a far different employment which she took upon herself in his service she had undertaken the principal charge of the child whose immediate attendant it was all the easier for her to be as they had determined not to put it into the hands of a nurse but to bring it up themselves by hand with milk and water in the beautiful season it was much out of doors enjoying the free air and ottilie liked best to take it out herself to carry the unconscious sleeping infant among the flowers and blossoms which should one day smile so brightly on its childhood among the young shrubs and plants which by their youth seemed designed to grow up with the young lord to their after stature when she looked about her she did not hide from herself to what a high position that child was born far and wide wherever the eye could see all would one day belong to him how desirable how necessary it must therefore be that it should grow up under the eyes of its father and its mother and renew and strengthen the union between them ottilie saw all this so clearly that she represented it to herself as conclusively decided and for herself as concerned with it she never felt at all under this fair heaven by this bright sunshine at once it became clear to her that her love if it would perfect itself must become altogether unselfish 
and there were many moments in which she believed it was an elevation which she had already attained she only desired the well-being of her friend she fancied herself able to resign him and never to see him any more if she could only know that he was happy the one only determination which she formed for herself was never to belong to another they had taken care that the autumn should be no less brilliant than the spring sunflowers were there and all the other plants which are never tired of blossoming in autumn and continue boldly on into the cold asters especially were sown in the greatest abundance and scattered about in all directions to form a starry heaven upon the earth from ottilie's diary any good thought which we have read anything striking which we have heard we commonly enter in our diary but if he would take the trouble at the same time to copy out of our friends letters the remarkable observations the original ideas the hasty words so pregnant in meaning which we might find in them we should then be rich indeed we lay aside letters never to read them again and at last we destroy them out of discretion and so disappears the most beautiful the most immediate breath of life irrecoverably for ourselves and for others i intend to make amends in future for such neglect so then once more the old story of the year is being repeated over again we are come now thank god again to its most charming chapter the violets and the mayflowers are its superscriptions and its vignettes it always makes a pleasant impression on us when we open again at these pages in the book of life we find fault with the poor particularly with the little ones among them when they loiter about the streets and beg do we not observe that they begin to work again as soon as ever there is anything for them to do hardly has nature unfolded her smiling treasures than the children are at once upon her track to open out a calling for themselves none of them beg any more they have each a nosegay to offer you they were out and gathering it before you had awakened out of your sleep and the supplicating face looks as sweetly at you as the present which the hand is holding out no person ever looks miserable who feels that he has a right to make a demand upon you how is it that the year sometimes seems so short and sometimes is so long how is it that it is so short when it is passing and so long as we look back over it when i think of the past and it never comes so powerfully over me as in the garden i feel how the perishing and the enduring work one upon the other and there is nothing whose endurance is so brief as not to leave behind it some trace of itself something in its own likeness we are able to tolerate the winter we fancy that we can extend ourselves more freely when the trees are so spectral so transparent they are nothing but they conceal nothing but when once the germs and buds begin to show then we become impatient for the full foliage to come out for the landscape to put on its body and the trees to stand before us as a form everything which is perfect in its kind must pass out beyond and transcend its kind it must be an inimitable something of another and a higher nature in many of its tones the nightingale is only a bird then it rises up above its class and seems as if it would teach every feathered creature what singing really is a life without love without the presence of the beloved is but poor comedie a tiroir we draw out slide after slide swiftly tiring of each and pushing it back to make haste to the next even what we know to be good and important hangs but wearily together every step is an end and every step is a fresh beginning end of chapter nine chapter ten of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter ten charlotte meanwhile was well and in good spirits she was happy in her beautiful boy whose fair promising little form every hour was a delight to both her eyes and heart in him she found a new link to connect her with the world and with her property her old activity began anew to stir in her again look which way she would she saw how much had been done in the year that was past and it was a pleasure to her to contemplate it enlivened by the strength of these feelings she climbed up to the summer-house with ottilie and the child and as she laid the latter down on the little table as on the altar of her house and saw the two seats still vacant she thought of gone-by times and fresh hopes rose out before her for herself and for ottilie young ladies perhaps looked timidly round them at this or that young man carrying on a silent examination whether they would like to have him for a husband but whoever has a daughter or a female ward to care for takes a wider circle in her survey and so it fared at this moment with charlotte to whom as she thought of how they had once sat side by side in that summer-house a union did not seem impossible between the captain and ottilie it had not remained unknown to her that the plans for the advantageous marriage 
which had been proposed to the captain, had come to nothing. Charlotte went on up the cliff, and Ottilie carried the child. A number of reflections crowded upon the former. Even on the firm land, there are frequent enough shipwrecks, and the true wise conduct is to recover ourselves and refit our vessel as fast as possible. Is life to be calculated only by its gains and losses? Who has not made arrangement on arrangement, and has not seen them broken in pieces? How often does not a man strike into a road and lose it again? How often are we not turned aside from one point which we had sharply before our eye, but only to reach some higher stage? The traveller, to his greatest annoyance, breaks a wheel upon his journey, and through this unpleasant accident makes some charming acquaintance, and forms some new connection which has an influence on all his life. Destiny grants us our wishes, but in its own way, in order to give us something beyond our wishes. Among these and similar reflections they reached the new building on the hill, where they intended to establish themselves for the summer. The view all round them was far more beautiful than could have been supposed. Every little obstruction had been removed. All the loveliness of the landscape, whatever nature, whatever the season of the year had done for it, came out in its beauty before the eye, and already the young plantations, which had been made to fill up a few openings, were beginning to look green and to form an agreeable connecting link between parts which before stood separate. The house itself was nearly habitable. The views, particularly from the upper rooms, were of the richest variety. The longer you looked round you, the more beauties you discovered. What magnificent effects would not be produced here at the different hours of the day, by sunlight and by moonlight? Nothing could be more delightful than to come and live there, and now that she found all the rough work finished, Charlotte longed to be busy again. An upholsterer, a tapestry hanger, a painter, who could lay on the colours with patterns, and a little gilding, were all which were required, and these were soon found, and in a short time the building was completed. Kitchen and cellar stores were quickly laid in, being so far from the castle it was necessary to have all essentials provided, and the two ladies with the child went up and settled there. From this residence, as from a new centre-point, unknown walks opened out to them, and in these high regions the free fresh air and the beautiful weather were thoroughly delightful. Ottilie's favourite walk, sometimes alone, sometimes with the child, was down below towards the plane trees, along a pleasant footpath leading directly to the point where one of the boats was kept chained, in which people used to go across the water. She often indulged herself in an expedition on the water only without the child, as Charlotte was a little uneasy about it. She never missed, however, paying a daily visit to the castle garden and the gardener, and going to look with him at his show of greenhouse plants, which were all out now, enjoying the free air. At this beautiful season Charlotte was much pleased to receive a visit from an English nobleman, who had made acquaintance with Edward abroad, having met him more than once, and who was now curious to see the laying out of his park, which he had heard so much admired. He brought with him a letter of introduction from the Count, and introduced at the same time a quiet but most agreeable man as his travelling companion. He went about seeing everything, sometimes with Charlotte and Ottilie, sometimes with the gardeners and the foresters, often with his friend, and now and then alone and they could perceive clearly from his observations that he took an interest in such matters, and understood them well, indeed that he had himself probably executed many such. Although he was now advanced in life, he entered warmly into everything which could serve for an ornament to life, or contribute anything to its importance. In his presence the ladies came first properly to enjoy what was round them. His practised eye received every effect in its freshness, and he found all the more pleasure in what was before him, as he had not previously known the place, and was scarcely able to distinguish what man had done there from what nature had presented to him ready-made. We may even say that through his remarks the park grew and enriched itself. He was able to anticipate in their fulfilment the promises of the growing plantations. There was not a spot where there was any effect which could be either heightened or produced, but what he observed it. In one place he pointed to a fountain which, if it was cleaned out, promised to be the most beautiful spot for a picnic party. In another, to a cave which had only to be enlarged and swept clear of rubbish, to form a desirable seat. A few trees might be cut down, and a view would be opened from it of some grand masses of rock, towering magnificently against the sky. He wished the owners joy that so much was still remaining for them to do, and he besought them not to be in a hurry about it, but to keep for themselves for years to come the pleasures of shaping and improving. At the hours which the ladies usually spent alone, he was never in the way, for he was occupied the greatest part of the day in catching such views in the park as would make good paintings in a portable camera obscura and drawing from them in order to secure some desirable fruits from his travels for himself and others. For many years past he had been in the habit of doing this in all remarkable places which he visited, and had provided himself by it with a most charming and interesting collection. He showed the ladies a large portfolio which he had brought with him, 
and entertained them with the pictures and with descriptions and it was a real delight to them here in their solitude to travel so pleasantly over the world and see sweep past them shores and havens mountains lakes and rivers cities castles and a hundred other localities which have a name in history each of the two ladies had an especial interest in it charlotte the more general interest in whatever was historically remarkable ottilie dwelling in preference on the scenes of which edward used most to talk where he liked best to stay and which he would most often revisit every man has somewhere far or near his peculiar localities which attract him scenes which according to his character either from first impressions or from particular associations or from habit have a charm for him beyond all others she therefore asked the earl which of all these places pleased him best where he would like to settle and live for himself if he might choose there was more than one lovely spot which he pointed out with what had happened to him there to make him love and value it and the peculiar accentuated french in which he spoke made it most pleasant to listen to him to the further question which was his ordinary residence which he properly considered his home he replied without any hesitation in a manner quite unexpected by the ladies i have accustomed myself by this time to be at home everywhere and i find after all that it is much more agreeable to allow others to plant and build and keep house for me i have no desire to return to my own possessions partly on political grounds but principally because my son for whose sake alone it was any pleasure to me to remain and work there who will by and by inherit it and with whom i hope to enjoy it took no interest in the place at all but has gone out to india where like many other foolish fellows he fancies he can make a higher use of his life he is more likely to squander it assuredly we spend far too much labour and outlay in preparation for life instead of beginning at once to make ourselves happy in a moderate condition we spread ourselves out wider and wider only to make ourselves more and more uncomfortable who is there now to enjoy my mansion my park my gardens not i nor any of mine strangers visitors or curious restless travellers even with large means we are ever but half and half at home especially in the country where we miss many things to which we have become accustomed in town the book for which we are most anxious is not to be had and just the thing which we most wanted is forgotten we take to being domestic only again to go out of ourselves if we do not go astray of our own will and caprice circumstances passions accidents necessity and one does not know what besides manage it for us little did the earl imagine how deeply his friend would be touched by these random observations it is a danger to which we are all of us exposed when we venture on general remarks in a society the circumstances of which we might have supposed were well enough known to us such casual wounds even from well-meaning kindly disposed people were nothing new to charlotte she so clearly so thoroughly knew and understood the world that it gave her no particular pain if it did happen that through somebody's thoughtlessness or imprudence she had her attention forced into this or that unpleasant direction but it was very different with ottilie at her half-conscious age at which she rather felt than saw and at which she was disposed indeed was obliged to turn her eyes away from what she should not or would not see ottilie was thrown by this melancholy conversation into the most pitiable state it rudely tore away the pleasant veil from before her eyes and it seemed to her as if everything which had been done all this time for house and court for park and garden for all their wide environs were utterly in vain because he to whom it all belonged could not enjoy it because he like their present visitor had been driven out to wander up and down in the world and indeed in the most perilous paths of it by those who were nearest and dearest to him she was accustomed to listen in silence but on this occasion she sat on in the most painful condition which indeed was made rather worse than better by what the stranger went on to say as he continued with his peculiar humorous gravity i think i am now on the right way i look upon myself steadily as a traveller who renounces many things in order to enjoy more i am accustomed to change it has become indeed a necessity to me just as in the opera people are always looking out for new and new decorations because there have already been so many i know very well what i am to expect from the best hotels and what from the worst it may be as good or it may be as bad as it will but i never find anything to which i am accustomed and in the end it comes to much the same thing whether we depend for our enjoyment entirely on the regular order of custom or entirely on the caprices of accident i have never to vex myself now because this thing is mislaid or that thing is lost because the room in which i live is uninhabitable and i must have it repaired because somebody has broken my favourite cup and for a long time nothing tastes well out of any other all this i am happily raised above if the house catches fire about my ears my people quietly pack my things up and we pass away out of the town in search of other quarters 
and considering all these advantages when i reckon carefully i calculate that by the end of the year i have not sacrificed more than it would have cost me to be at home in this description ottilie saw nothing but edward before her how he too was now amidst discomfort and hardship marching along untrodden roads lying out in the fields in danger and want and in all this insecurity and hazard growing accustomed to be homeless and friendless learning to fling away everything that he might have nothing to lose fortunately the party separated for a short time ottilie escaped to her room where she could give way to her tears no weight of sorrow had ever pressed so heavily upon her as this clear perception which she tried as people usually do to make still clearer to herself that men love to dally with and exaggerate the evils which circumstances have once begun to inflict upon them the state in which edward was came before her in a light so piteous so miserable that she made up her mind let it cost her what it would that she would do everything in her power to unite him again with charlotte and she herself would go and hide her sorrow and her love in some silent scene and beguile the time with such employment as she could find meanwhile the earl's companion a quiet sensible man and a keen observer had remarked the mistake in the conversation and spoke to his friend about it the latter knew nothing of the circumstances of the family but the other being one of those persons whose principal in interest in travelling lay in gathering up the strange occurrences which arose out of the natural or artificial relations of society which were produced by the conflict of the restraint of law with the violence of the will of the understanding with the reason of passion with prejudice had some time before made himself acquainted with the outline of the story and since he had been in the family he had learnt exactly all that had taken place and the present position in which things were standing the earl of course was very sorry but it was not a thing to make him uneasy a man must hold his tongue altogether in society if he is never to find himself in such a position for not only remarks with meaning in them but the most trivial expressions may happen to clash in an inharmonious key with the interest of somebody present we will set things right this evening said he and escape for any general conversation you shall let them hear one of the many charming anecdotes with which your portfolio and your memory have enriched themselves while we have been abroad however with the best intentions the strangers did not on this next occasion succeed any better in gratifying their friends with unalloyed entertainment the earl's friend told a number of singular stories some serious something amusing some touching some terrible with which he had roused their attention and strained their interest to the highest tension and he thought to conclude with a strange but softer incident little dreaming how nearly it would touch his listeners the two strange children two children of neighbouring families a boy and a girl of an age which would suit well for them at some future time to marry were brought up together with this agreeable prospect and the parents on both sides who were people of some positions in the world looked forward with pleasure to their future union it was too soon observed however that the purpose seemed likely to fail the dispositions of both children promised everything which was good but there was an unaccountable antipathy between them perhaps they were too much like each other both were thoughtful clear in their wills and firm in their purposes each separately was beloved and respected by his or her companions but whenever they were together they were always antagonists forming separate plans for themselves they only met mutually to cross and thwart one another never emulating each other in pursuit of one aim but always fighting for a single object good-natured and amiable everywhere else they were spiteful and even malicious whenever they came in contact this singular relation first showed itself in their childish games and it continued with their advancing years the boys used to play at soldiers divide into parties and give each other battle and the fierce haughty young lady set herself at once at the head of one of the armies and fought against the other with such animosity and bitterness that the latter would have been put to a shameful flight except for the desperate bravery of her own particular rival who at last disarmed his antagonist and took her prisoner and even then she defended herself with so much fury that to save his eyes from being torn out and at the same time not to injure his enemy he had been obliged to take off his silk handkerchief and tie her hands with it behind her back this she never forgave him she made so many attempts she laid so many plans to injure him that the parents who had been long watching these singular passions came to an understanding together and resolved to separate these two hostile creatures and sacrifice their favourite hopes the boy shot rapidly forward in the new situation in which he was placed he mastered every subject which he was taught his friends and his own inclination chose the army for his profession and everywhere let him be where he would he was looked up to and beloved his disposition seemed formed to labour for the well-being and the pleasure of others and he himself without being clearly conscious of it 
was in himself happy at having got rid of the only antagonist which nature had assigned to him the girl on the other hand became at once an altered creature her growing age the progress of her education above all her own inward feelings drew her away from the boisterous games with boys in which she had hitherto delighted altogether she seemed to want something there was nothing anywhere about her which could deserve to excite her hatred and she had never found any one whom she could think worthy of her love a young man somewhat older than her previous neighbour antagonist of rank property and consequence beloved in society and much sought after by women bestowed his affections upon her it was the first time that friend lover or servant had displayed any interest in her the preference which he showed for her above others who were older more cultivated and of more brilliant pretensions than herself was naturally gratifying the constancy of his attention which was never obtrusive his standing by her faithfully through a number of unpleasant incidents his quiet suit which was declared indeed to her parents but which as she was still very young he did not press only asking to be allowed to hope all this engaged him to her and custom and the assumption in the world that the thing was already settled carried her along with it she had so often been called his bride that at last she began to consider herself so and neither she nor any one else ever thought any further trial could be necessary before she exchanged rings with the person who for so long a time had passed for her bridegroom the peaceful course which the affair had all along followed was not at all precipitated by the betrothal things were allowed to go on both sides just as they were they were happy in being together and they could enjoy to the end the fair season of the year as the spring of their future more serious life the absent youth had meanwhile grown up into everything which was most admirable he had obtained a well-deserved rank in his profession and came home on leave to visit his family towards his fair neighbour he found himself again in a natural but singular position for some time past she had been nourishing in herself such affectionate family feelings as suited her position as a bride she was in harmony with everything about her she believed that she was happy and in a certain sense she was so now first for a long time something again stood in her way it was not to be hated she had become incapable of hatred indeed the childish hatred which had in fact been nothing more than an obscure recognition of inward worth expressed itself now in a happy astonishment in pleasure at meeting in ready acknowledgments in a half willing half unwilling and yet irresistible attraction and all this was mutual their long separation gave occasion for longer conversations even their old childish foolishness served now that they had grown wiser to amuse them as they looked back and they felt as if at least they were bound to make good their petulant hatred by friendliness and attention to each other as if their first violent injustice to each other ought not to be left without open acknowledgment on his side it all remained in a sensible desirable moderation his position his circumstances his efforts his ambition found him so abundant an occupation that the friendliness of this pretty bride he received as a very thankworthy present but without therefore even so much as thinking of her in connection with himself or entertaining the slightest jealousy of the bridegroom with whom he stood on the best possible terms with her however it was altogether different she seemed to herself as if she had awakened out of a dream her fightings with her young neighbour had been the beginnings of an affection and this violent antagonism was no more than an equally violent innate passion for him first showing under the form of opposition she could remember nothing else than that she had always loved him she laughed over her martial encounter with him with weapons in her hand she dwelt upon the delight of her feelings when he disarmed her she imagined that it had given her the greatest happiness when he bound her and whatever she had done afterwards to injure him or to vex him presented itself to her as only an innocent means of attracting his attention she cursed their separation she bewailed the sleepy state into which she had fallen she execrated the insidious lazy routine which had betrayed her into accepting so insignificant a bridegroom she was transformed doubly transformed forwards or backwards whichever way we like to take it she kept her feelings entirely to herself but if any one could have divined them and shared them with her he could not have blamed her for indeed the bridegroom could not sustain a comparison with the other as soon as they were seen together if a sort of regard to the one could not be refused the other excited the fullest trust and confidence if one made an agreeable acquaintance the other we should desire for a companion and in extraordinary cases where higher demands might have to be made on them the bridegroom was a person to be utterly despaired of while the other would give the feeling of perfect security 
there is a peculiar innate tact in women which discovers to them differences of this kind and they have cause as well as occasion to cultivate it the more the fair bride was nourishing all these feelings in secret the less opportunity there was for any one to speak a word which could tell in favour of her bridegroom to remind her what her duty and their relative position advised and commanded indeed what an unalterable necessity seemed now irrevocably to require the poor heart gave itself up entirely to its passion on one side she was bound inextricably to the bridegroom by the world by her family and by her own promise on the other the ambitious young man made no secret of what he was thinking and planning for himself conducting himself towards her no more than a kind but not at all a tender brother and speaking of his departure as immediately impending and now it seemed as if her early childish spirit woke up again in her with all its spleen and violence and was preparing itself in its distemper on this higher stage of life to work more effectively and destructively she determined that she would die to punish the once hated and now so passionately loved youth for his want of interest in her and as she could not possess himself at least she would wed herself for ever to his imagination and to his repentance her dead image should cling to him and he should never be free from it he should never cease to reproach himself for not having understood not examined not valued her feelings toward him this singular insanity accompanied her wherever she went she kept it concealed under all sorts of forms and although people thought her very odd no one was observant enough or clever enough to discover the real inward reason in the meantime friends relations acquaintances had exhausted themselves in contrivances for pleasure parties scarcely a day had passed but something new and unexpected was set on foot there was hardly a pretty spot in the country round which had not been decked out and prepared for the reception of some merry party and now our young visitor before departing wished to do his part as well and invited the young couple with a small family circle to an expedition on the water they went on board a large beautiful vessel dressed out in all its colours one of the yachts which had a small saloon and a cabin or two besides and i intended to carry with them upon the water the comfort and conveniences of land they set out upon the broad river with music playing the party had collected in the cabin below deck during the heat of the day and were amusing themselves with games their young host who could never remain without doing something had taken charge of the helm to relieve the old master of the vessel and the latter had lain down and was fast asleep it was a moment when the steerer required all his circumspectness as the vessel was nearing a spot where two islands narrowed the channel of the river while shallow banks of shingle stretching off first on one side and then on the other made the navigation difficult and dangerous prudent and sharp-sighted as he was he thought for a moment that it would be better to wake the master but he felt confident in himself and he thought he would venture and make straight for the narrows at this moment his fair enemy appeared upon deck with a wreath of flowers in her hair take this to remember me by she cried out she took it off and threw it to the steerer don't disturb me he answered quickly as he caught the wreath i require all my powers and all my attention now you will never be disturbed by me any more she cried you will never see me again as she spoke she rushed to the forward part of the vessel and from thence she sprang into the water voice upon voice called out save her save her she is sinking he was in the most terrible difficulty in the confusion the old shipmaster woke and tried to catch the rudder which the young man bid him take but there was no time to change hands the vessel stranded and at the same moment flinging off the heaviest of his upper garments he sprang into the water and swam towards his beautiful enemy the water is a friendly element to a man who is at home in it and who knows how to deal with it it buoyed him up and acknowledged the strong swimmer as its master he soon overtook the beautiful girl who had been swept away before him he caught hold of her raised her and supported her and both of them were carried violently down by the current till the shoals and islands were left far behind and the river was again open and running smoothly he now began to collect himself they had passed the first immediate danger in which he had been obliged to act mechanically without time to think he raised his head as high as he could to look about him and then swam with all his might to a low bushy point which ran out conveniently into the stream there he brought his fair burden to dry land but he could find no signs of life in her he was in despair when he caught sight of a trodden path leading among the bushes again he caught her up in his arms hurried forward and presently reached a solitary cottage there he found kind good people a young married couple the misfortunes and the dangers explained themselves instantly every remedy he could think of was instantly applied 
a bright fire blazed up woollen blankets were spread on a bed counterpane cloaks skins whatever there was at hand which would serve for warmth were heaped over her as fast as possible the desire to save life overpowered for the present every other consideration nothing was left undone to bring back to life the beautiful half torpid naked body it succeeded she opened her eyes her friend was before her she threw her heavenly arms about his neck in this position she remained for a time and then a stream of tears burst out and completed her recovery will you forsake me she cried now when i find you again thus never he answered never hardly knowing what he said or did only consider yourself she added take care of yourself for your sake and for mine she now began to collect herself and for the first time recollected the state in which she was she could not be ashamed before her darling before her preserver but she gladly allowed him to go that he might take care of himself for the clothes which he still wore were wet and dripping the young host considered what could be done the husband offered the young man and the wife offered the fair lady the dresses in which they had been married which were hanging up in full perfection and sufficient for a complete suit inside and out for two people in a short time a pair of adventurers were not only equipped but in full costume they looked most charming gazed at one another when they met with admiration and then with infinite affection half laughing at the same time at the quaintness of their appearance they fell into each other's arms the power of youth and the quickening spirit of love in a few moments completely restored them and there was nothing wanted but music to have set them both off dancing to have found themselves brought from the water on dry land from death into life from the circle of their families into a wilderness from despair into rapture from indifference to affection and to love all in a moment the head was not strong enough to bear it it must either burst or go distracted or if so distressing an alternative were to be escaped the heart must put out all its efforts lost wholly in each other it was long before they recollected the alarm and anxiety of those who had been left behind and they themselves indeed could not well think without alarm and anxiety how they were again to encounter them shall we run away shall we hide ourselves said the young man we will remain together she said as she clung about his neck the peasant having heard them say that a party was aground on the shoal had hurried down without stopping to ask another question to the shore when he arrived there he saw the vessel coming safely down the stream after much labour it had been got off and they were now going on in uncertainty hoping to find their lost ones again somewhere the peasant shouted and made signs to them and at last caught the attention of those on board then he ran to a spot where there was a convenient place for landing and went on signalling and shouting till the vessel's head was turned toward the shore and what a scene there was for them when they landed the parents of the two betrothed first pressed on the banks the poor loving bridegroom had almost lost his senses they had scarcely learnt that their dear children had been saved when in their strange disguise the latter came forward out of the bushes to meet them no one recognised them till they were come quite close who do i see cried the mothers what do i see cried the fathers the preserved ones flung themselves on the ground before them your children they called out a pair forgive us cried the maiden give us your blessing cried the young man give us your blessing they cried both as all the world stood still in wonder your blessing was repeated the third time and who would have been able to refuse it end of chapter ten chapter eleven of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter eleven the narrator made a pause or rather he had already finished his story before he observed the emotion into which charlotte had been thrown by it she got up uttered some sort of an apology and left the room to her it was a well-known history the principal incident in it had really taken place with the captain and a neighbour of her own not exactly indeed as the englishman had related it but the main features of it were the same it had only been more finished off and elaborated in its details as stories of that kind always are when they have passed first through the lips of the multitude and then through the fancy of a clever and imaginative narrator the result of the process being usually to leave everything and nothing as it was ottilie followed charlotte as the two friends begged her to do and then it was the earl's turn to remark that perhaps they had made a second mistake and that the subject of the story had been well known to or was in some way connected with the family 
we must take care he added that we do no more mischief here we seem to bring little good to our entertainers for all the kindness and hospitality which they have shown us we will make some excuse for ourselves and then take our leave i must confess answered his companion that there is something else which still holds me here which i should be very sorry to leave the house without seeing cleared up or in some way explained you were too busy yourself yesterday when we were in the park with the camera in looking for spots where you could make your sketches to have observed anything else which was passing you left the broad walk you remember and went to a sequestered place on the side of the lake there was a fine view of the opposite shore which you wished to take well ottilie who was with us got up to follow and then proposed that she and i should find our way to you in the boat i got in with her and was delighted with the skill of my fair conductress i assured her that never since i had been in switzerland where the young ladies so often filled the place of the boatmen had i been so pleasantly ferried over the water at the same time i could not help asking her why she had shown such an objection to going the way which you had gone along the little by-path i had observed her shrink from it with a sort of painful uneasiness she was not at all offended if you will promise not to laugh at me she answered i will tell you as much as i know about it but to myself it is a mystery which i cannot explain there is a particular spot in that path which i never pass without a strange shiver passing over me which i do not remember ever feeling anywhere else and which i cannot the least understand but i shrink from exposing myself to the sensation because it is followed immediately after by a pain on the left side of my head from which at other times i suffer severely we landed ottilie was engaged with you and i took the opportunity of examining the spot which she pointed out to me as we went by on the water i was not a little surprised to find there distinct traces of coal in sufficient quantities to convince me that at a short distance below the surface there must be a considerable bed of it pardon me my lord i see you smile and i know very well that you have no faith in these things about which i am so eager and that it is only your sense and your kindness which enable you to tolerate me however it is impossible for me to leave this place without trying on that beautiful creature an experiment with a pendulum the earl whenever these matters came to be spoken of never failed to repeat the same objections to them over and over again and his friend endured them all quietly and patiently remaining firm nevertheless to his own opinion and holding to his own wishes he too again repeated that there was no reason because the experiment did not succeed with every one that they should give them up as if there was nothing in them but fancy they should be examined into all the more earnestly and scrupulously and there was no doubt that the result would be the discovery of a number of affinities of inorganic creatures for one another and of organic creatures for them and again for each other which at present were unknown to us he had already spread out his apparatus of gold rings marcasites and other metallic substances a pretty little box of which he always carried about with himself and he suspended a piece of metal by a string over another piece which he placed upon the table now my lord he said you may take what pleasure you please i can see in your face what you are feeling at perceiving that nothing will set itself in motion with me or for me but my operation is no more than a pretence when the ladies come back they will be curious to know what strange work we are about the ladies returned charlotte understood at once what was going on i have heard much of these things she said but i never saw the effect myself you have everything ready there let me try whether i can succeed in producing anything she took the thread in her hand and as she was perfectly serious she held it steady and without any agitation not the slightest motion however could be detected ottilie was then called upon to try she held the pendulum still more quietly and unconsciously over the plate on the table but in a moment the swinging piece of metal began to stir with a distinct rotatory action and turned as they moved the position of the plate first to one side and then to the other now in circles now in ellipses or else describing a series of straight lines doing all the earl's friend could expect and far exceeding indeed all his expectations the earl himself was a little staggered but the other could never be satisfied from delight and curiosity and begged for the experiment again and again with all sorts of variations ottilie was good-natured enough to gratify him till at last she was obliged to desire to be allowed to go as her headache had come on again in further admiration and even rapture he assured her with enthusiasm that he would cure her for ever of her disorder if she would only trust herself to his remedies for a moment they did not know what he meant 
but charlotte who comprehended immediately after declined his well-meant offer not liking to have introduced and practised about her a thing of which she had always had the strongest apprehensions the strangers were gone and notwithstanding their having been the inadvertent cause of strange and painful emotions left the wish behind them that this meeting might not be the last charlotte now made use of the beautiful weather to return visits in the neighbourhood which indeed gave her work enough to do seeing that the whole country round some from a real interest some merely from custom had been most attentive in calling to inquire after her at home her delight was the sight of the child and really it well deserved all love and interest people saw in it a wonderful indeed a miraculous child the brightest sunniest little face a fine well-proportioned body strong and healthy and what surprised them more the double resemblance which became more and more conspicuous in figure and in the features of the face it was like the captain the eyes every day it was less easy to distinguish from the eyes of ottilie ottilie herself partly from this remarkable affinity perhaps still more under the influence of that sweet woman's feeling which makes them regard with the most tender affection the offspring even by another of the man they love was as good as a mother to the little creature as it grew or rather she was a second mother of another kind if charlotte was absent ottilie remained alone with the child and the nurse nanny had for some time past been jealous of the boy for monopolizing the entire affections of her mistress she had left her in a fit of crossness and gone back to her mother ottilie would carry the child about in the open air and by degrees took longer and longer walks with it she took her bottle of milk to give the child its food when it wanted any generally too she took a book with her and so with the child in her arms reading and wandering she made a very pretty penserosa end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of part two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter twelve the object of the campaign was attained and edward with crosses and decorations was honourably dismissed he betook himself at once to the same little estate where he found exact accounts of his family waiting for him on whom all this time without their having observed it or known of it a sharp watch had been kept under his orders his quiet residence looked most sweet and pleasant when he reached it in accordance with his orders various improvements had been made in his absence and what was wanting to the establishment in extent was compensated by its internal comforts and conveniences edward accustomed by his more active habits of life to take decided steps determined to execute a project which he long had sufficient time to think over first of all he invited the major to come to him this pleasure in meeting again was very great to both of them the friendships of boyhood like relationship of blood possess this important advantage that mistakes and misunderstandings never produce irreparable injury and the old regard after a time will always re-establish itself edward began with inquiring about the situation of his friend and learnt that fortune had favoured him exactly as he most could have wished he then half seriously asked whether there was not something going forward about a marriage to which he received a most decided and positive denial i cannot and will not have any reserve with you he proceeded i will tell you at once what my own feelings are and what i intend to do you know my passion for ottilie you must long have comprehended that it was this which drove me into the campaign i do not deny that i desired to be rid of a life which without her would be of no further value to me at the same time however i acknowledged that i could never bring myself utterly to despair the prospect of happiness with her was so beautiful so infinitely charming that it was not possible for me entirely to renounce it feelings too which i cannot explain and a number of happy omens have combined to strengthen me in the belief in the assurance that ottilie will one day be mine the glass with our initials cut upon it which was thrown into the air when the foundation stone was laid did not go to pieces it was caught and i have it again in my possession after many miserable hours of uncertainty spent in this place i said to myself i will put myself in the place of this glass and it shall be an omen whether our union be possible or not i will go i will seek for death not like a madman but like a man who still hopes that he may live ottilie shall be the prize for which i fight ottilie shall be behind the ranks of the enemy 
in every entrenchment in every beleaguered fortress i shall hope to find her and to win her i will do wonders with the wish to survive them with the hope to gain ottilie not to lose her these feelings have led me on they have stood by me through all dangers and now i find myself like one who has arrived at his goal who has overcome every difficulty and who has nothing more left in his way ottilie is mine and whatever lies between the thought and the execution of it i can only regard as unimportant with a few strokes you blot out replied the major all the objections that we can or ought to urge upon you and yet they must be repeated i must leave it to yourself to recall the full value of your relation with your wife but you owe it to her and you owe it to yourself not to close your eyes to it how can i so much as recollect that you have had a son given to you without acknowledging at once that you two belong to one another for ever that you are bound for this little creature's sake to live united that united you may educate it and provide for its future welfare it is no more than the blindness of parents answered edward when they imagine their existence to be of so much importance to their children whatever lives finds nourishment and finds assistance and if the son who has early lost his father does not spend so easy so favoured a youth he profits perhaps for that very reason in being trained sooner for the world and comes to a timely knowledge that he must accommodate himself to others a thing which sooner or later we are all forced to learn here however even these considerations are irrelevant we are sufficiently well off to be able to provide for more children than one and it is neither right nor kind to accumulate so large a property on a single head the major attempted to say something of charlotte's worth and edward's long-standing attachment to her but the latter hastily interrupted him we committed ourselves to a foolish thing that i see all too clearly whoever in middle age attempts to realize the wishes and hopes of his early youth invariably deceives himself each ten years of a man's life has its own fortunes its own hopes its own desires woe to him who either by circumstances or by his own infatuation is induced to grasp at anything before him or behind him we have done a foolish thing are we to abide by it all our lives are we from some respect of prudence to refuse to ourselves what the customs of the age do not forbid in how many matters do men recall their intentions and their actions and shall it not be allowed to them here here where the question is not of this thing or of that but of everything not of our single condition of life but of the whole complex life itself again the major powerfully and impressively urged on edward to consider what he owed to his wife what was due to his family to the world and to his own position but he could not succeed in producing the slightest impression all these questions my friend he returned i have considered already again and again they have passed before me in the storm of battle when the earth was shaking with the thunder of the cannon with the balls singing and whistling round me with my comrades falling right and left my horse shot under me my hat pierced with bullets they have floated before me by the still watch-fire under the starry vault of the sky i have thought them all through felt them all through i have weighed them and i have satisfied myself about them again and again and now for ever at such moments why should i not acknowledge it to you you too were in my thoughts you too belong to my circle as indeed you and i have long belonged to one another if i have ever been in your debt i am now in a position to repay it with interest if you have been in mine you have now the means to make it good to me i know that you love charlotte and she deserves it i know that you are not indifferent to her and why should she not feel your worth take her at my hand and give ottilie to me and we shall be the happiest beings upon the earth if you choose to assign me so high a character replied the major it is the more reason for me to be firm and prudent whatever there may be in this proposal to make it attractive to me instead of simplifying the problem it only increases the difficulty of it the question is now of me as well as of you the fortunes the good name the honour of two men hitherto unsullied with a breath will be exposed to hazard by so strange a proceeding to call it by no harsher name and we shall appear before the world in a highly questionable light our very characters being what they are replied edward give us a right to take this single liberty a man who has borne himself honourably through a whole life makes an action honourable which might appear ambiguous in others as concerns myself after these last trials which i have taken upon myself after the difficult and dangerous actions which i have accomplished for others i feel entitled now to do something for myself for you and charlotte that part of the business may if you like it be given up but neither you nor any one shall keep me from doing what i have determined if i may look for help and furtherance i shall be ready to do everything which can be wished but if i am to be left to myself or if obstacles are to be thrown in my way 
some extremity or other is sure to follow the major thought it his duty to combat edward's purposes as long as it was possible and now he changed the mode of his attack and tried a diversion he seemed to give way and only spoke of the form of what they would have to do to bring about this separation and these new unions and so mentioned a number of ugly undesirable matters which threw edward into the worst of tempers i see plainly he cried at last that what we desire can only be carried by storm whether it be from our enemies or from our friends i keep clearly before my own eyes what i demand what one way or another i must have and i will seize it promptly and surely connections like ours i know very well cannot be broken up and reconstructed again without much being thrown down which is standing and much having to give way which would be glad enough to continue we shall come to no conclusion by thinking about it all rights are alike to the understanding and it is always easy to throw extra weight into the ascending scale do you make up your mind my friend to act and act promptly for me and for yourself disentangle and untie the knots and tie them up again do not be deterred from it by nice respects we have already given the world something to say about us it will talk about us once more and when we have ceased to be a nine days wonder it will forget us as it forgets everything else and allow us to follow our own way without further concern with us the major had nothing further to say and was at last obliged to sit silent while edward treated the affair as now conclusively settled talked through in detail all that had to be done and pictured the future in every most cheerful colour and then he went on again seriously and thoughtfully if we think to leave ourselves to the hope to the expectation that all will go right again of itself that accident will lead us straight and take care of us it will be a most culpable self-deception in such a way it would be impossible for us to save ourselves or re-establish our peace again i who have been the innocent cause of it all how am i ever to console myself by my own importunity i prevailed on charlotte to write to you to stay with us and utterly followed in consequence we have had no more control over what ensued out of this but we have the power to make it innocuous to guide the new circumstances to our own happiness can you turn away your eyes from the fair and beautiful prospects which i open to us can you insist to me can you insist to us all on a wretched renunciation of them do you think it possible is it possible will there be no vexations no bitterness no inconvenience to overcome if we resolve to fall back into our old state and will any good any happiness whatever arise out of it will your own rank will the high position which you have earned be any pleasure to you if you are to be prevented from visiting me or from living with me and after what has passed it would not be anything but painful charlotte and i with all our property would only find ourselves in a melancholy state and if like other men of the world you can persuade yourself that years and separation will eradicate our feelings will obliterate impressions so deeply engraved why then the question is of these very years which it would be better to spend in happiness and comfort than in pain and misery but the last and most important point of all which i have to urge is this supposing that we our outward and inward condition being what it is could nevertheless make up our minds to wait at all hazards and bear what is laid upon us what is to become of ottilie she must leave our family she must go into society where we shall not be to care for her and she will be driven wretchedly to and fro in a hard cold world describe to me any situation in which ottilie without me without us could be happy and you will then have employed an argument which will be stronger than every other and if i will not promise to yield to it if i will not undertake at once to give up all my own hopes i will at least reconsider the question and see how what you have said will affect it this problem was not so easy to solve at least no satisfactory answer to it suggested itself to his friend and nothing was left to him except to insist again and again how grave and serious and in many senses how dangerous the whole undertaking was and at least that they ought maturely to consider how they had better enter upon it edward agreed to this and consented to wait before he took any steps but only under the condition that his friend should not leave him until they had come to a perfect understanding about it and until the first measures had been taken End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of part two of elective affinities this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe part two chapter thirteen men who are complete strangers and wholly indifferent to one another if they live a long time together are sure both of them to expose something of their inner nature 
and thus a kind of intimacy will arise between them all the more was it to be expected that there would soon be no secrets between our two friends now that they were again under the same roof together and in daily and hourly intercourse they went over again the earlier stages of their history and the major confessed to edward that charlotte had intended ottilie for him at the time at which he returned from abroad and hoped that some time or other he might marry her edward was in ecstasies at this discovery he spoke without reserve of the mutual affection of charlotte and the major which because it happened to fall in so conveniently with his own wishes he painted in very lively colours deny it altogether the major could not at the same time he could not altogether acknowledge it but edward only insisted on it the more he had pictured the whole thing to himself not as possible but as already concluded all parties had only to resolve on what they all wished there would be no difficulty in obtaining a separation the marriages should follow as soon after as possible and edward could travel with ottilie of all the pleasant things which imagination pictures to us perhaps there is none more charming than when lovers and young married people look forward to enjoying their new relation to each other in a fresh new world and test the endurance of the bond between them in so many changing circumstances the major and charlotte were in the meantime to have unrestricted powers to settle all questions of money property and other such important worldly matters and to do whatever was right and proper for the satisfaction of all parties what edward dwelt the most upon however what he seemed to promise himself the most advantage from was this as the child would have to remain with the mother the major would charge himself with the education of it he would train the boy according to his own views and develop what capacities there might be in him it was not for nothing that he had received in his baptism the name of otto which belonged to them both edward had so completely arranged everything for himself that he could not wait another day to carry it into execution on their way to the castle they arrived at a small town where edward had a house and where he was to stay to await the return of the major he could not however prevail upon himself to alight there at once and accompanied his friend through the place they were both on horseback and falling into some interesting conversation rode on further together on a sudden they saw in the distance the new house on the height with its red tiles shining in the sun an irresistible longing came over edward he would have it all settled that very evening he would remain concealed in a village close by the major was to urge the business on charlotte with all his power he would take her prudence by surprise and oblige her by the unexpectedness of his proposal to make a free acknowledgment of her feelings edward had transferred his own wishes to her he felt certain that he was only meeting her half-way and that her inclinations were as decided as his own and he looked for an immediate consent from her because he himself could think of nothing else joyfully he saw the prosperous issue before his eyes and that it might be communicated to him as swiftly as possible a few cannon shots were to be fired off and if it was dark a rocket or two sent up the major rode to the castle he did not find charlotte there he learnt that for the present she was staying at the new house at that particular time however she was paying a visit in the neighbourhood and she probably would not have returned till late that evening he walked back to the hotel to which he had previously sent his horse edward in the meantime unable to sit still from restlessness and impatience stole away out of his concealment along solitary paths only known to foresters and fishermen into his park and he found himself towards evening in the copse close to the lake the broad mirror of which he now for the first time saw spread out in its perfectness before him ottilie had gone out that afternoon for a walk along the shore she had the child with her and read as she usually did while she went along she had gone as far as the oak tree by the ferry the boy had fallen asleep she sat down laid it on the ground at her side and continued reading the book was one of those which attract persons of delicate feeling and afterwards will not let them go again she forgot the time and the hours she never thought what a long way round it was by land to the new house but she sat lost in her book and in herself so beautiful to look at that the trees and the bushes round her ought to have been alive and to have had eyes given them to gaze upon her and admire her the sun was sinking a ruddy streak of light fell upon her from behind tinging with gold her cheek and shoulder edward who had made his way to the lake without being seen finding his park desolate and no trace of human creature to be seen anywhere went on and on at last he broke through the copse behind the oak tree and saw her at the same moment she saw him he flew to her and threw himself at her feet after a long silent pause in which they both endeavoured to collect themselves he explained in a few words why and how he had come there he had sent the major to charlotte and perhaps at that moment their common destiny was being decided never had he doubted her affection and she assuredly had never doubted his he begged for her consent she hesitated he implored her 
he offered to resume his old privilege and throw his arms around her and embrace her she pointed down to the child edward looked at it and was amazed great god he cried if i had cause to doubt my wife and my friend this face would witness fearfully against them is not this the very image of the major i never saw such a likeness indeed replied ottilie all the world say it is like me is it possible edward answered and at the moment the child opened its eyes two large black piercing eyes deep and full of love already the little face was full of intelligence he seemed as if he knew both the figures which he saw standing before him edward threw himself down beside the child and then knelt a second time before ottilie it is you he cried the eyes are yours ah but let me look into yours let me throw a veil over that ill-starred hour which gave its being to this little creature shall i shock your pure spirit with the fearful thought that man and wife who are estranged from each other can yet press each other to their heart and profane the bonds by which the law unites them by other eager wishes oh yes as i have said so much as my connection with charlotte must now be severed as you will be mine why should i not speak out the words to you this child is the offspring of a double adultery it should have been a tie between my wife and myself but it severs her from me and me from her let it witness then against me let these fair eyes say to yours that in the arms of another i belong to you you must feel ottilie oh you must feel that my fault my crime i can only expiate in your arms hark he called out as he sprang up and listened he thought that he had heard a shot and that it was the sign which the major was to give it was the gun of a forester on the adjoining hill nothing followed edward grew impatient ottilie now first observed that the sun was down behind the mountains its last rays were shining on the windows of the house above leave me edward she cried go long as we have been parted much as we have borne yet remember what we both owe to charlotte she must decide our fate do not let us anticipate her judgment i am yours if she will permit it to be so if she will not i must renounce you as you think it is now so near an issue let us wait go back to the village where the major supposes you to be is it likely that a rude cannon shot will inform you of the results of such an interview perhaps at this moment he is seeking for you he will not have found charlotte at home of that i am certain he may have gone to meet her for they knew at the castle where she was how many things may have happened leave me she must be at home by this time she is expecting me with the baby above ottilie spoke hurriedly she called together all the possibilities it was too delightful to be with edward but she felt that he must now leave her i beseech i implore you my beloved she cried out go back and wait for the major i obey your commands cried edward he gazed at her for a moment with rapturous love and then caught her close in his arms she wound her own about him and pressed him tenderly to her breast hope streamed away like a star shooting in the sky above their heads they thought then they believed that they did indeed belong to one another for the first time they exchanged free genuine kisses and separated with pain and effort the sun had gone down it was twilight and a damp mist was rising about the lake ottilie stood confused and agitated she looked across to the house on the hill and she thought she saw charlotte's white dress on the balcony it was a long way round by the end of the lake and she knew how impatiently charlotte would be waiting for the child she saw the plane trees just opposite her and only a narrow interval of water divided her from the path which led straight up to the house her nervousness about venturing on the water with the child vanished in her present embarrassment she hastened to the boat she did not feel that her heart was beating that her feet were tottering that her senses were threatening to fail her she sprang in seized the oar and pushed off she had to use force she pushed again the boat shot off and glided swaying and rocking into the open water with the child in her left arm the book in her left hand and the oar in her right she lost her footing and fell over the seat the oar slipped from her on one side and as she tried to recover herself the child and book slipped on the other all into the water she caught the floating dress but lying entangled as she was herself she was unable to rise her right hand was free but she could not reach round to help herself up with it at last she succeeded she drew the child out of the water but its eyes were closed and it had ceased to breathe in a moment she recovered all her self-possession but so much the greater was her agony the boat was driving fast into the middle of the lake the oar was swimming far away from her she saw no one on the shore and indeed if she had it would have been of no service to her cut off from all assistance she was floating on the faithless unstable element she sought for help from herself she had often heard of the recovery of the drowned she had herself witnessed an instance of it on the evening of her birthday 
she took off the child's clothes and dried it with her muslin dress she threw open her bosom laying it bare for the first time to the free heaven for the first time she pressed a living being to her pure naked breast alas and it was not a living being the cold limbs of the ill-starred little creature chilled her to the heart streams of tears gushed from her eyes and lent a show of life and warmth to the outside of the torpid limbs she persevered with her efforts she wrapped it in her shawl she drew it close to herself stroked it breathed upon it and with tears and kisses laboured to supply the help which cut off as she was she was unable to find it was all in vain the child lay motionless in her arms motionless the boat floated on the glassy water but even here her beautiful spirit did not leave her forsaken she turned to the power above she sank down upon her knees in the boat and with both arms raised the unmoving child above her innocent breast like marble in its whiteness alas too like marble cold with moist eyes she looked up and cried for help where a tender heart hopes to find it in its fullness when all other help has failed the stars were beginning one by one to glimmer down upon her she turned to them and not in vain a soft air stole over the surface and wafted the boat under the plane trees End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of part two of Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities, part two by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter fourteen. She hurried to the new house and called the surgeon and gave the child into his hands. It was carried at once to Charlotte's sleeping room cool and collected from a wide experience he submitted the tender body to the usual process ottilie stood by him through it all she prepared everything she fetched everything but as if she were moving in another world for the height of misfortune like the height of happiness alters the aspect of every object and it was only when after every resource had been exhausted the good man shook his head and to her questions whether there was hope first was silent and then answered with a gentle no that she left the apartment and had scarcely entered the sitting-room when she fell fainting with her face upon the carpet unable to reach the sofa at that moment charlotte was heard driving up the surgeon implored the servants to keep back and allow him to go to meet her and prepare her but he was too late while he was speaking she had entered the drawing-room she found ottilie on the ground and one of the girls of the house came running and screaming to her open-mouthed the surgeon entered at the same moment and she was informed of everything she could not at once however give up all hope she was flying upstairs to the child but the physician besought her to remain where she was he went himself to deceive her with a show of fresh exertions and she sat down upon the sofa ottilie was still lying on the ground charlotte raised her and supported her against herself and her beautiful head sank down upon her knee the kind medical man went backwards and forwards he appeared to be busy about the child his real care was for the ladies and so came on midnight and the stillness grew more and more deathly charlotte did not try to conceal from herself any longer that her child would never return to life again she desired to see it now it had been wrapped up in warm woollen coverings and it was brought down as it was lying in its cot which was placed at her side on the sofa the little face was uncovered and there it lay in its calm sweet beauty the report of the accident soon spread through the village every one was roused and the story reached the hotel the major hurried up the well-known road he went round and round the house at last he met a servant who was going to one of the outbuildings to fetch something he learned from him in what state things were and desired him to tell the surgeon that he was there the latter came out not a little surprised at the appearance of his old patron he told him exactly what had happened and undertook to prepare charlotte to see him he then went in began some conversation to distract her attention and led her imagination from one object to another till at last he brought it to rest upon her friend and the depth of feeling and of sympathy which would surely be called out in him from the imaginative she was brought at once to the real enough she was informed that he was at the door that he knew everything and desired to be admitted the major entered charlotte received him with a miserable smile he stood before her she lifted off the green silk covering under which the body was lying and by the dim light of a taper he saw before him not without a secret shudder the stiffened image of himself charlotte pointed to a chair and there they sat opposite to one another without speaking through the night ottilie was still lying motionless on charlotte's knee she breathed softly and slept or seemed to sleep 
the morning dawned the lights went out the two friends appeared to awake out of a heavy dream charlotte looked towards the major and said quietly tell me through what circumstances you have been brought hither to take part in this morning scene the present is not a time the major answered in the same low tone as that in which charlotte had spoken for fear lest she might disturb ottilie this is not a time and this is not a place for reserve the condition in which i find you is so fearful that even the earnest matter on which i am here loses its importance by the side of it he then informed her quite calmly and simply of the object of his mission in so far as he was the ambassador of edward of the object of his coming in so far as his own free will and his own interests were concerned in it he laid both before her delicately but uprightly charlotte listened quietly and showed neither surprise nor unwillingness as soon as the major had finished she replied in a voice so light that to catch her words he was obliged to draw his chair closer to her in such a case as this i have never before found myself but in similar cases i have always said to myself how will it be to-morrow i feel very clearly that the fate of many persons is now in my hands and what i have to do is soon said without scruple or hesitation i consent to the separation i ought to have made up my mind to it before by my unwillingness and reluctance i have destroyed my child there are certain things on which destiny obstinately insists in vain may reason may virtue may duty may all holy feelings place themselves in its way something shall be done which to it seems good and which to us seems not good and it forces its own way through at last let us conduct ourselves as we will and indeed what am i saying it is but my own desire my own purpose against which i acted so unthinkingly which destiny is again bringing in my way did i not long ago in my thoughts design edward and ottilie for one another did i not myself labour to bring them together and you my friend you yourself were an accomplice in my plot why why could i not distinguish mere man's obstinacy from real love why did i accept his hand when i could have made him happy as a friend and when another could have made him happy as a wife and now look here on this unhappy slumberer i tremble for the moment when she'll recover out of this half death sleep into consciousness how can she endure to live how shall she ever console herself if she may not hope to make good that to edward of which as the instrument of the most wonderful destiny she has deprived him and she can make it all good again by the passion by the devotion with which she loves him if love be able to bear all things it is able to do yet more it can restore all things of myself at such a moment i may not think do you go quietly away my dear major say to edward that i consent to the separation that i leave it to him to you and to mittler to settle whatever is to be done i have no anxiety for my own future condition it may be what it will it is nothing to me i will subscribe whatever paper is submitted to me only he must not require me to join actively i cannot have to think about it or give advice the major rose to go she stretched out her hand to him across ottilie he pressed it to his lips and whispered gently and for myself may i hope anything do not ask me now replied charlotte i will tell you another time we have not deserved to be miserable but neither can we say that we have deserved to be happy together the major left her and went feeling for charlotte to the bottom of his heart but not being able to be sorry for the fate of the poor child such an offering seemed necessary to him for their general happiness he pictured ottilie to himself with a child of her own in her arms as the most perfect compensation for the one of which she had deprived edward he pictured himself with his own son on his knee who should have better right to resemble him than the one which was departed with such flattering hopes and fancies passing through his mind he returned to the hotel and on his way back he met edward who had been waiting for him the whole night through in the open air since neither rocket nor report of cannon would bring him news of the successful issue of his undertaking he had already heard of the misfortune and he too instead of being sorry for the poor creature regarded what had befallen it without being exactly ready to confess it to himself as a convenient accident through which the only impediment in the way of his happiness was at once removed the major at once informed him of his wife's resolution and he therefore easily allowed himself to be prevailed upon to return again with him to the village and from thence to go for a while to the little town where they would consider what was next to be done and make their arrangements after the major had left her charlotte sat on buried in her own reflections but it was only for a few minutes ottilie suddenly raised herself from her lap and looked full with her large eyes in her friend's face then she got up from off the ground and stood upright before her this is the second time began the noble girl with an irresistible solemnity of manner this is the second time that the same thing has happened to me 
You once said to me that similar things often befall people more than once in their lives in a similar way, and if they do, it is always at important moments. I now find that what you said is true, and I have to make a confession to you. Shortly after my mother's death, when I was a very little child, I was sitting one day on a footstool, close to you. You were on the sofa, as you are at this moment, and my head rested on your knees. I was not asleep, I was not awake, I was in a trance. I knew everything which was passing about me, I heard every word which was said with the greatest distinctness, and yet I could not stir, I could not speak, and if I had wished it I could not have given a hint that I was conscious. On that occasion you were speaking about me to one of your friends. You were commiserating my fate, left as I was a poor orphan in the world. You described my dependent position, and how unfortunate a future was before me, unless some very happy star watched over me. I understood well what you said. I saw, perhaps too clearly, what you appeared to hope of me, and what you thought I ought to do. I made rules to myself, according to such limited insight as I had, and by these I have long lived. By these, at the time when you so kindly took charge of me, and had me with you in your home, I regulated whatever I did, and whatever I left undone. But I have wandered out of my course, I have broken my rules, I have lost the very power of feeling them. And now, after a dreadful occurrence, you have again made clear to me my situation, which is more pitiable than the first. While lying in a half torpor on your lap, I have again, as if out of another world, heard every syllable which you uttered. I know from you how all is with me. I shudder at the thought of myself. But again, as I did then, in my half-sleep of death, I have marked out my new path for myself. I am determined, as I was before, and what I have determined I must tell you at once. I will never be Edward's wife. In a terrible manner, God has opened my eyes to see the sin in which I was entangled. I will atone for it, and let no one think to move me from my purpose. It is by this, my dearest, kindest friend, that you must govern your own conduct. Send for the Major to come back to you. Write to him that no steps must be taken. It made me miserable that I could not stir or speak when he went. I tried to rise. I tried to cry out. Oh, why did you let him leave you with such unlawful hopes? Charlotte saw Ottilie's condition, and she felt for it but she hoped that by time and persuasion she might be able to prevail upon her. On her uttering a few words, however, which pointed to a future, to a time when her sufferings would be alleviated, and when there might be better room for hope. No, Ottilie cried, with vehemence, do not endeavour to move me, do not seek to deceive me. At the moment at which I learn that you have consented to the separation, in that same lake I will expiate my errors and my crimes. End of chapter 14